Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon, and I am Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between the current events and the broader historic context in which the events take place. This will enable you to better understand and analyze these events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, the issue is The Guardian and other outlets have reported that the Biden campaign has decided to jumpstart its 2024 re-election by highlighting highlighting what they perceive to be a sharp contrast with former President Trump. Ailing in opinion polls, Biden has decided to jumpstart this campaign with events designed to symbolize the fight for democracy and racial justice against Trump. So the question is, what are Americans to do in a 2024 election when many of them don't have faith in the process and or the system? Well, for insight into this, let's turn to my guest. He's a scholar and activist. He's an expert in W.E.B. Du Bois, one of the most cited Du Bois scholars in the world. He's an organizer with the Philadelphia Saturday Free School. He's Dr. Anthony Montero. Tony? Welcome to Connecting the Dots podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, let's uh, let's let's do this as a as a first uh, uh, first point here. Let's uh, just a little just a little data. Uh, Joe Biden's job approval. This is according to Real Clear Politics. Forty percent approve. Fifty six percent disapprove. That's a negative, almost 16% uh, rating. Direction of the country, is a, is the country headed in the right direction? About 24% say uh, right direction, 67% say wrong direction. It's about a f- negative 42% spread. Tony, your thoughts on where we are right now as we look towards November of 2024? Well, we'll, I I think uh, we have to start with the polling numbers. Uh, Over the last almost five months now, uh, from reputable uh, polling uh, companies, uh, Biden has been losing to Trump and his favorable numbers have been in uh, decline. Uh, In fact, uh, in many respects, Biden's approval numbers are below 40%. Uh, The real clear uh, politics numbers are an average. Yeah, that's that's an aggregator, yes. That's right. But I think uh, for the most part, for the most credible polls, uh, we're continuing to see Biden in the mid-30s. This is unprecedented for a sitting president at this stage of a campaign. Not only in the mid-30s, but heading south. He's, and no no, uh, no pun intended as it relates to the uh, the border, but as they would say on the corner, he's hustling backwards. Oh yeah, there's there's no question. this is unprecedented. I don't think this has ever been seen uh, in the modern history of polling presidents and uh, their attempts at re-election. Uh, I think what the public is saying is that we don't trust Biden. Uh, his presidency has failed. Inflation is still hitting working people and the lower middle class very hard. The jobs that they are counting 
as showing an, uh, a, a vibrant economy are in many cases gig jobs, jobs without benefits, uh, jobs uh, without security. Uh, and in many cases, uh, at the lower end of the minimum wage. Uh, so, in fact, hang on, hang on to hang on to that point, mm -hmm. because one of the things that one of the misnomers that people have about these employment or job numbers is that they uh, equate job to one person working, mm -hmm. one person working, one job. Yes. But in in this gig economy, what that now means is in many instances, you have one person working multiple jobs just to remain poor. Absolutely. So so the you know, when you were when you were growing up, when I was growing up, we heard these job numbers and and we they usually meant one person, one job. Yeah. That's no longer the case, but they don't factor that in to their analysis, particularly as they're explaining these numbers to the people. So when you hear, oh, unemployment down to 3.5%, there are also a lot of other factors that go into this that don't reflect a strong economy. What they reflect is a middle class, a working class, and a poor a uh, group of people that are struggling to get by. Oh, th there's no question about it. And people are are, are saying uh, to pollsters uh, what you and I know, that uh, the majority of working people, the majority of the lower middle class are not doing good at all. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, cannot afford food and that is uh, where the rubber meets the road, where you go to the supermarket and try to buy eggs and milk and cereal and other things that you need. And there you discover that inflation is as bad as it's ever been, while there's some relief at the gas pump. But when it comes to feeding your family, things are not good. When it comes to paying rent, or renting an apartment, things are bad. When it comes to getting a mortgage, you can almost forget that. So uh, the Biden campaign, who in uh, the, the spring and summer of last year said they're going to run on Bi Bidenomics until they realized that that was a, a sure enough loser <laughs> because Biden had produced an economy which was austerity for the majority and good times and big profits for the billionaire class, uh, reflecting the fact that inequality is greater now, perhaps, than at any time in uh, the last 80 years. Uh, this is a serious situation for the people. And when people say that the country is moving in the right direct, the wrong direction, forgive me, when 70% of them say that, uh, what they are saying is things don't look good for them and things look even worse for their children and grandchildren. That is where we're at going into perhaps the most consequential election in the modern history of the United States. In fact, to that point, there have been uh, studies and reports out uh, recently indicating that the American dream is dying. Uh, yes. I, I want to say, and I might be slightly off on my numbers, but the point is valid, that polling those who were born in 1940, uh, almost 90 percent of those born in 1940 are now doing better than their parents were able to do. Right. Those born in 1980, only 50% of those polled were able to say that they're doing better than their parents did. That tells us that the American dream is dying. You mentioned last year Biden wanted to run on Bidenomics and uh, 
uh, I have to now wonder if it's been determined that Bidenomics is no more than than voodoo economics, a la George H. W. Bush, yes. referring to Reagan's plan. So we're talking voodoo economics 4.0. <laughs> yeah, we're looking at something like that, but we're looking at the fact that the Biden administration and the Biden campaign uh, have no way to achieve narrative hegemony. That is, uh, they thought that given the fact that most of the corporate media or all of the corporate media uh, would be a propaganda arm of the Biden administration and of his uh, reelection campaign, and given that uh, elites, uh, for example, university professors, uh, politicians, uh, part of the religious community, certain labor leaders or most labor leaders would all be on their side, that they would, would be able to achieve narrative hegemony, by which I mean that what they were putting forward would be uh, dominant over what their opposition would try to put forward. So the narrative would be controlled by the Biden uh, campaign. That has not happened. Uh, and the reason it has not happened is that the nation is in a profound crisis of legitimacy, where no matter what Biden says, the results will be the same in terms of the majority of people. They don't trust Biden. They don't trust insiders. They don't trust elites, be they university professors or presidents, be they politicians, be they uh, church leaders, be they labor leaders, uh, be they military leaders. People do not trust the institutions and those who lead them in this country. And therefore, this point, mm -hmm. people will vote against rather than vote for necessarily. People, I think, in November, and this will gather momentum throughout this year, will kind of uh, set into a mindset that says any body but those who are currently uh, in the highest office of the country. They will vote against Biden. Biden will not be able to dig out of the hole that he's in. Uh, so I, I would predict that in November, we will have a new president. Uh, and not just a new president, but the nation will enter upon, in this year, a political realignment, the likes of which we have not seen since uh, the uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, years in the presidency. I wanted to throw out one more data point on the food issue, because we have been seeing stories on uh, local media affiliates about the rise of retail theft in this country. And we've been seeing, you know, the, the flash mobs that run into the high-end stores and steal Gucci bags and all kind of stuff. But what's not being reported as much is theft of retail in grocery stores, people stealing food, and the Guardian in the UK has us to show the international implications of this brick brits stealing food to sell on the black market the uk's cost of living crisis is fueling a record surge in shoplifting as people increasingly turn to black to the black market for food the items most commonly stolen are meat cheese and sweets because those are the items that can be stolen in large quantities and can be sold on the black market. So I wanted I wanted to 
make that demonstrate that point to show that it's not only happening here in the United States, it's also happening to some of the U.S. allies that are blindly following the United following the United States yeah. down this perilous rabbit hole. And you you, you mentioned, and as a as a fellow political scientist, uh, you know we we were taught people tend not to vote against things; mm -hmm. they vote for things. Mm -hmm. But in this instance, yeah. the the script is being flipped because things are so bad. That's why Biden can't run on his record. He's got to run on, I'm not Trump, a negative message, trying to convince people to vote against something. And uh, so I just wanted to, uh, and uh, oh, final point, I don't think Biden's going to be on the ticket. Uh, yeah, why do you say that? I think that's a possibility, but why do you say it? I say that because the numbers are so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't understand how anybody uh, in the in the uh, in the Democrat Party elite can look at these numbers and think they've got a winning ticket. Yeah, I, that's one point. No, that's the, fine. You know, when you're when you're in th at thirty five percent approval rating, how uh, that means that you got sixty five percent of people that. <laughs> that disapprove that's a losing bet yeah and also with his cognitive decline i don't see look they're not having any debates they're within the primaries they're not having any debates they're not allowing any democrat challengers to challenge him and they've also come out now and said they may not even participate in the general election debates because they know that he cannot stand on a stage unscripted for 45 minutes and engage in, in combat, in, in, yeah. in intellectual combat. Yeah. He can't do it. Yeah. I don't see him on the ticket. Well, I would agree with you. And I think uh, given what you just said, there's a, there's a big irony here. Uh, the Democrats are shutting down all the primary opponents for Joe Biden, even though those opponents, Marion Williams and the other guy, are doing uh, abysmally poorly. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's no way they can win. But the Democrats don't even want to have a public debate with those people. So they're shutting down democracy in the name of, of democracy. democracy. Uh, and the claim that Trump is a threat to our democracy, when in fact, uh, what we see is that the Biden campaign is, uh, is pursuing a campaign that is anti-democratic in the primaries and in the general election, and supports, this is what is also interesting, supports the the two states that have already uh, kicked Biden off the ballot and the and Trump. Seven, Kick Trump, off the ballot. Trump off the ballot, forgive me, mm -hmm. and the 17 others that have uh, uh, legal suits that have been filed to put him off the ballot. So here we have, in the name of democracy, perhaps the most anti-democratic campaign in our history. You mentioned people not trusting in the, well, I mentioned people not trusting in the system. You mentioned that as well. And I really want people to understand this conversation is not an anti-Biden conversation. It's not an anti or pro-Trump conversation. We're, we're social scientists and, and we're looking at the data and uh, Pew Research Center uh, has a poll out from September of uh, 23, public trust in government from 1958 to 2023. Public trust in the federal government, which has been low for decades, has returned to near record lows following a modest uptick up through 21. Currently, fewer than two in 10 Americans say they trust the government in Washington to do what is right? Yeah. Uh, that's that's the data. That, that's not my opinion. That's not your opinion. 
That's the data. So I just wanted to throw out that data point so the people listening to this saying, oh, these, these guys are going into this anti-Biden conversation. No. no we're just well, we're, we're just giving you the giving you the numbers. Yeah, and uh and, and to your point uh about uh Biden not not uh being on the ticket by the time of the Democratic National Convention. Now that is my opinion, uh, but yeah, that's an and <laughs> that's but, my opinion. Uh but you have uh leading figures in the Democratic Party calling for Biden to step aside. Uh they're usually uh, saying on the basis of age, but they're also saying more than that when they're not speaking publicly. Uh, a lot of this is coming from the Obama wing of the Democratic establishment. Uh, as you know, the, um, the Biden wing, uh, which is also the Hillary Clinton wing, is the most powerful side of this. However, the Obama people, uh, especially Axelrod, mm -hmm. uh, and probably some others, have uh, come Ig out. David Ignatius. Uh, David Ignatius. Well, they, definitely, I would say, but I would say he's not with the Obama wing. Oh, no, no. But he's, no, I, he, I was just saying he wrote, a, he wrote, he yes. came out before Axelrod did. That's right. That's right. And, and so, uh, these figures are saying Biden can't win. Uh, uh, Robert Kagan, mm -hmm. who writes mainly on foreign policy, is saying that for the sake of national security, uh, Biden should step aside and, and allow a more capable uh, Democrat to challenge uh, uh, Trump. But uh, the thing is, the question is, uh, will Biden do it? Uh, and can he do it? Uh, what do they do? Who do they turn to if Biden is not the candidate? Uh, Kamala Harris, certainly not. No. Uh, I just don't. I mean, maybe the governor of uh, California. But besides winning California, with, which Democrats will win anyway, what does he bring to the conversation and to, and to the contest? For the presidency, I just don't think uh, they have an alternative to Biden. They're going to have to go with him, come hell or high water, and that is the paradox, the dilemma of the Democratic Party at this moment. And you know, to add um, to add more hurt to the situation. Uh, with the war in Gaza uh, and people looking at babies and children and mothers being bombed, uh, Biden has now lost the youth vote. Uh, Trump is leading him by six percentage points among young people. Uh, I don't know when in recent history a Republican has won the youth vote, maybe Reagan. But Democrats almost could take young people as a part of their coalition. And now they are bleeding black voters, especially black male voters, who I contend are the angriest part of the electorate, the most alienated, the most angry, and those who say, for example, if you're in the barber shop, you might hear the conversation where uh, one of the people says, I am for anybody except Biden, and I am for the one that the Biden people and the establishment hate the most. If Biden hates them, I can see a path to aligning or voting for them. You mentioned uh, who who do the who do the Democrats turn to? Yeah. In a in a baseball analogy, I will say they got no arms in the bullpen. They're they're calling the bullpen, and nobody's answering the phone. But I think the only options they have are Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, mm -hmm. and Gretchen Whitmer, 
the governor of Michigan. And I, I'm not saying that this is a winning ticket. What I'm saying is any port in a storm and they don't have many options here. Gavin Newsom is young. Gavin Newsom is white. Gavin Newsom looks great in a suit. And he's the governor of California. So there is a he there. And well, so let me let me say he, he checks off those boxes. Uh, Gretchen Whitmer is young, white, female, fairly attractive, uh, and the governor of Michigan, which is a state they can't afford to lose. And right now, to your point, based upon uh, Biden's approach to the genocide in Gaza, they've alienated African Americans in Michigan, they've alienated Arabs in Michigan. So by putting Gretchen Whitmer on the ticket that might enable them to salvage Michigan and by throwing Kamala Harris overboard because she's a big fat zero um, uh, by putting another female on the ticket, they may be able to offset some of that ire from females, from women who are angry about Kamala being jettisoned. So that's, I'm not saying it's going to win. When I look at the options, when you have no options, that's your only option. It's a desperate situation. And then you got Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Cornell West and uh, who knows who else if there's a no labels candidate mm -hmm. uh, like Joe Manchin or the former governor of Maryland. Uh, and they're nipping at Biden's coattails. Uh, a head up Biden, Trump, uh, it gets close. But if you throw these independents in there, mm -hmm. uh, Trump goes ahead. It seems like uh, the independents take more from uh, Biden than they do from Trump. Uh, it's a very desperate situation mm -hmm. uh, for Biden and the uh, elite of the ruling class, the ruling elite. Uh, they have no answers. Um, you know, it's it's just all over the place. Um, the president emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Richard Haas, uh, went so far as to say the greatest threat to America's national security is not Russia or China. It's the rebellion of the people here at home who are against war, who are against war spending, when there is not hardly enough being done for the people here uh, and who are angry about open borders. I mean, it's, it's, it's a situation that I don't admire the people who have to live it and have to try to work through it. Uh, it's a lose-lose situation, I think, for the Democrats. I want to mention one more name, and we, we mentioned uh, Kamala Harris, and so there are those who are listening that are saying, wait a minute, why are y'all saying uh, they're going to throw her overboard? Well, as the sous chef of the word salad, uh, I don't know that Kamala Harris <laughs> brings anything of substance to the game. Uh, she, ha she had to leave the campaign uh, early, and she didn't even make it to the first debate. Uh, well, she did make it to the first debate, um, but she didn't make it to any primaries. She couldn't get 1% of the vote. So again, folks, this ain't anti-Kamala. I'm looking at the numbers. Yeah. And the African-American community didn't want her. Why is the nation going to want her? I, I Again, sous chef for the word salad. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't see it. But... but you were also talking about people, uh, black males and others voting for Trump. How much of this do you think will be actually people crossing over party lines versus people just deciding to stay home? As, as a friend of mine says, uh, they're going to stay home and rake leaves. They're not going to uh, they're not going to turn out to vote. Well, you know, uh, we see it here in Philadelphia. 
We just went through a mayoral election, uh, the Democratic primary, which is the major uh, election that chooses uh, the mayor because the city is so overwhelmingly Democratic. Uh, and uh, the leading candidate, uh, one of the two or three leading candidates was a black woman. Uh, and in spite of that, 75% of registered black voters did not turn out. Uh, when it got to the general election where her uh, victory was more or less guaranteed, again, uh, only about 25 or 26% of registered black voters turned out. And this is for a black woman, which would have made her the first black woman mayor uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, most black voters didn't see it as a historic opportunity to do anything. Mm. But that is prologue for what will happen in this November. Black Philadelphia, whose turnout decides which way the state of Pennsylvania goes in presidential elections, I would suggest to you will not turn out in adequate numbers to deliver Pennsylvania, which is a major battleground state, to Biden. They are fed up, they are tired, and in fact, uh, they're sick and tired of being used by Democrats who, once the election is over, uh, look the other way, in fact, run in the opposite direction from the Black community. And so um, on all of the issues uh, that people are concerned about in their day-to-day -day life, uh, the Democrats who run this city have done horribly uh, for the people. And uh, the separation between the Democratic Party elite and politicians and the masses of Black people who regularly vote overwhelmingly for Democrats is so wide that uh, uh, the way I see it right now, uh, Biden would have a very difficult time uh, winning the state of Pennsylvania. What do you think about the discussion that if, in fact, he loses or whoever they decide to put on the ticket does not prevail, uh, they're going to blame Black people for failing to turn out. We're seeing uh, a number of articles. There was a New York Times article, uh, Black voters uh, shift to Trump. Uh, why Black, Latino, and Asian voters are leaving the Democratic Party. As Black voters drift to Trump, Biden's allies say they have work to do. Some Black men lose faith in Biden and Democrats in 2024. I remember uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign and when she lost, there were many and many African-Americans and African-American women of, of democratic note that were coming out and saying, we did not turn out, therefore we got stuck with Trump, never taking into account that Hillary Clinton ran a horrific campaign in Philadelphia. She ran a horrific campaign. She didn't campaign in Michigan. Okay. She rolled out Barack Obama the last two or three days of the election. Just, uh, uh, as my older brother would say, just felony stupid kind of things. Um, but then turned around and blamed us. Your thoughts? Uh, my thought is, so what? I mean, the, the blame game is going to be played however the election goes. Uh, and I think as a black man, most black men don't care anymore uh, who blames us for whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the most alienated, politically alienated group in the electorate. Uh, we feel that we have nothing to lose by abandoning the Democratic Party, which most black men feel, especially as you hit into the working class and mm -hmm. the working poor, most black men feel 
that we have gotten nothing from the Democratic Party. And let me tell you another thing. You know, black men have a longer memory than people give us credit for. We haven't forgotten the crime bill of uh, 1994 and Joe Biden uh, being the major uh, spokesman for it publicly and in the Senate. So we haven't forgotten that. We haven't forgotten mass incarceration. We haven't uh, forgotten the unequal treatment that black men experience in every sphere of social life in this country. There is deep resentment uh, among black men. Uh, polls can't fully uh, detect mm -hmm. and explain what black men feel, but it's a deep resentment and a sense of betrayal. So I think black men, no matter what elites say, don't care anymore. So now the Biden administration has decided that they're going to uh, they're going to retool. They're going to talk about democracy and saving democracy when, in fact, not having prime Democratic primaries, not allowing candidates on the ballot to run against Joe Biden, not having debates is anti-democratic. So they want to save democracy by being anti-democratic. Yeah. It helped me understand that. Yes, but the people also don't probably many don't never knew and don't remember that after the 20 uh the 2020 election Joe Biden was was basically forced to have a meeting with African American leadership those that were responsible for putting him over the top it was oh probably about 10 days maybe 2 weeks after his inauguration that they finally got him into the room and the readout from the meeting was that he was so disrespectful to the members of leadership that, you know, Reverend Sharpton and uh, um, so many others, Mignon Moore and all of these black Democrats begged him for the meeting. He comes to the meeting and I think it was a teleconference that they had or Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. And folks had to pull his coat and say, hey, man, you need to, you you, you don't, in, instead of the leadership hanging up on him saying, hey, dude, you're talking to the wrong people. They, of course, they went ahead, took the whipping. Yeah. But a, a, just another data point. So now they want to come out and talk about saving democracy and racism under Donald Trump. I, it's, why? It's, people are not going to buy it. Uh, the whole country uh, is in a state of protest against the establishment. I don't think people understand this very well. Uh, a crisis of legitimacy means that the people do not accept the leaders of the society. And that means... Uh, in universities, it means politicians, it means journalists, it means wherever uh, a dominant elite figures run things, people reject them, soundly reject them. Uh, you know, I always mention uh, the Italian revolutionary Antonio Gramsci, who said from a prison cell, where he was confined by uh, Benito Mussolini, the fascist leader of Italy in the 1930s, uh, Gramsci said, the old is dying and the new cannot yet be born. Uh, I think in this country, we see that the old system of political rule, of the organization of political power is dying. Uh, however, I do see that the new is being born, and it's from the bottom up, not from the top down. Uh, and if you are a black leader who is connected to white elites, uh, black folks see you as as much illegitimate as the white power structure. 
They don't see a difference uh, between the black misleadership class, as it is now called, uh, and the white establishment. So uh, black people do not uh, generally protest uh, uh, blacks in high spaces being fired by whites that control those spaces because they don't see those people as black in the sense of standing up for ordinary black people. Uh, so, you know, what is, what is the end goal? What is the objective uh, of this logic? Uh, it is a profound political realignment of the country. Uh, you see it in the labor movement. Labor leaders take one position and all the workers in those unions vote in the opposite way. Not all, but the majority of them vote opposite to what the leaders say uh, they or how the leaders say they should vote. Uh, that is a crisis of leadership, a crisis of legitimacy. Uh, the same is true in the uh, black community. Uh, most black leaders, the overwhelming majority of so-called black leaders are going to come out and say to black people, we should vote for Biden. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say uh, a huge part of the black electorate will not vote and a considerable part of the black electorate will vote for Trump or one of the independent candidates, either Cornel West or uh, JFK Jr. or whoever else is out there. They're, they're in rebellion in the labor movement, in the black community, in the uh, Mexican and Hispanic communities. There's a rebellion against the established order. Uh, and uh, the elites can't rule. They're not trusted. We have not seen this. We have not seen this. I don't know, even in the time of the Civil War, if it got this bad. Uh, now, you know, uh, desperate times often produces desperate measures. Uh, let's hope that the elites, especially those uh, institutionalized in the deep state, don't attempt to do anything crazy, uh, like uh, a provocation that could be used to justify uh, calling the election off, uh, or a, a provocation that could lead to a major war, let us say, with Iran, or uh, something serious with China, where uh, they could declare a national emergency and say that if Biden is, does not remain in office, the nation uh, faces a, uh, a foreign threat that could undermine our nation. Uh, I don't rule any of that out. Uh, I think the easy way would be to remove Biden and put somebody else as the candidate. Uh, but that does not guarantee very much. Uh, Gavin Newsom or anyone else might not do as well as Biden can do, uh, even though they look good in a suit. Uh, but I, I think it's a, a, a more than desperate situation. It is an existential uh, and a systemic crisis for the ruling elite, for the political order as we have known it. Uh, and so Biden and those who are the elites, the Democratic Party is the party of elites. In fact, the two parties are almost the direct opposite of what they were 50 years ago, where the Democrats were the party of black people in the working class and women and so on. Now it is becoming the opposite, that the Democratic Party is the party of the rich. It is the richest party, the most wealthy party, perhaps in human history. There's not been nothing like it. Whereas the Republicans have become what the Democrats were. And so it's, uh, it is a deep 
undoing of what was and the possible replacement with something that we have not seen uh, since the Great Depression and Franklin Roosevelt. You know, his administration was the result of a political realignment Mm -hmm. uh, and his presidency redefined what the Democratic Party was, uh, leading to, you know, John F. Kennedy and um, finally the alignment of the Democratic Party with the civil rights movement. Uh, That was the last time we saw anything like this, but we're coming close to that happening similarly in this period. And you mentioned uh, black elite coming out and telling African-Americans that they need to vote for the Democratic Party. And let's let's unpack quickly what that what they're advocating that we vote for. They're advocating that we spend more money in Ukraine, that we waste more money in Ukraine, that we pay for the uh, salaries of Ukrainian civil servants, that we pay for the retirement plans of Ukrainian civil servants, that we pay for the health care for Ukrainians. We don't have those things here. That's when the when the Black Caucus votes in favor of this funding. This is what they're voting for. They're voting for us to send more weapons to commit genocide in Gaza. Your taxpayer dollars are paying for genocide. It's paying to try their damnedest to start a fight with China. Mm-hmm. We haven't won a fight since 1953. Yes, yeah, true. Unless you want to throw in uh, uh, Grenada and yeah. and Panama. Uh, yeah, I think we won that, right? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you could throw Iraq in there. Uh, no, but, no, that was an ass whooping too. Don't. Oh, uh, oh I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to so, say I, I wouldn't include. Korea in there because that was a standoff. That that fight still hasn't ended. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so so you know you mentioned Gramsci. I mentioned I'll mention Fred Hampton okay. as he said. That's why we come up with answers that don't answer, explanations that don't explain, and you come up with conclusions that don't conclude. When you have members of the caucus that want to convince black people that we need to pay Kenya to invade Haiti. These are the things that they are advocating that we do. And how do I know that? Because that's the stuff they voted for. Again, you just got to look at the data. Yeah. Dr. Montero. Well, of course. I mean, uh, and I think... uh... Well, we've been talking about these matters for a long time. Uh, In a sense, uh, the majority of Black people have caught up to where we have been. Uh, And um, they don't trust the Black Congressional Caucus. They might sometimes trust their individual congressperson. Right. But not the caucus, not the Congress. As a body. As a body, that's what I'm saying. Right. Uh, And certainly, the more they learn about their individual congressperson, the less they will trust them. And you're right. Uh, Black people have returned after the Obama years to our historic position of being anti-war and anti-military spending. And most in the Congressional Black Caucus are big military spenders. They are big spenders on aid to uh, Ukraine and now to the genocide in Gaza. Um, Well, some people say uh, that the Jewish lobby, or better, the Israeli lobby in the United States, Mm -hmm. controls the Congressional Black Caucus. uh, And many of the mayors in the Black mayors in in the United States, for example, the one in New York and Mm -hmm. the one here in Philadelphia, who are embarrassments, you know, (laughs) given the uh, historic uh, peace attitude 
anti-war attitude of black folk. So really quickly to that point, mm -hmm. it's so uh, help me with the with the what I perceive to be hypocrisy here. Mm -hmm. We get our shorts all in a bunch when Russia is tampering with our election and our hair gets set on fire. China is tampering with our election, but somehow the Israeli lobby can spend hundreds of millions of dollars buying votes and influencing electoral outcomes at the state and local level. I, I see that as, as being somewhat, somewhat hypocritical, Dr. Montero. What say you? I agree with you, <laughs> Dr. Leah. It is, it is profoundly hypocritical. But isn't that what American politics has descended into, where money talks, the Congress, for the most part, is bought and paid for. And it is it is really a, a grotesque thing for we Black people to look at Black elected officials who overwhelmingly are elected because of the Black voter. And we have to be for real about it. We didn't actually, as a people, have the vote until 1965. And now the people who have benefited from the struggle for voting rights and benefited from black people voting in hope that by putting black people in high places, some things can change. Uh, we're now looking at, uh, as you say, a hypocritical group of opportunists who dance to the piper that pays the most. So and that's, that's why I called it, I, I wrote a piece mm -hmm. called the, the Dangers of Minstrel Diplomacy. I saw that, yes. Because yes. it's basically a black face on white folks' foolishness. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, really quickly, uh, shifting gears, you, you, uh, what has happened with the resignation of uh, uh, Harvard's president, yeah. uh, Charlene Gay? And I bring that up because she's one of a few that have that have lost their their positions recently um uh, do you see this as an attack on free speech do you see this as an attack on intellectualism um at the at the academic level well uh yes but it did not start with the president of harvard mm -hmm or the president of the University of Pennsylvania or of MIT or uh, the faculty at Cornell University or wherever. The universities, especially the elite ones, had been captured by, by the billionaire class uh, some time ago. Uh, if you were looking for freedom of speech, maybe the last place that you should have gone would have been to a university. Uh, the professoriate uh, is uh, literally, has literally been subdued, silenced. Uh, they uh, know how to keep their mouths shut and they know that if they uh, speak out on issues they shouldn't speak out on, like the Palestinian cause, uh, that they will be uh, fired and driven out of the university and driven into poverty. Now, as to the first uh, black president of Harvard University, uh, you know, she wrote an op-ed in the New York Times, and in it, she drew attention to the to, to the fact that what she was going through was much larger than her and much larger than Harvard University. And it was a matter of speech and the rights of students uh, to speak, uh, as well as the rights of faculty. Uh, but I cannot believe that she did not know what she was getting herself into when she was made the president of Harvard. She had been around mm -hmm. Harvard for some years. She knew. For example, that Cornell West was denied tenure while she was there. Mm -hmm. She wasn't president, 
but she was in the administration. Cornel West was denied tenure because of his views on Palestine. You knew that. So uh, why is it all right to reduce Cornell West and to diminish him as a scholar and a public intellectual and nothing is said by most of the black faculty, if not all of the black faculty and administration at Harvard, but suddenly when it happens to you, it's something that we should all rise up and be concerned about. No, Harvard had done away with effective free speech several decades ago. The American University is a scandal of corruption, of uh, money controlling what goes on, of, 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 of professors and, and departments being bought. Uh, it, it's a scandal. So uh, yes, she is right. It is an attack upon free speech. But has there been free speech any of the time that Professor Gay has been at Harvard? I don't think so. And uh, I go back to the George W. Bush administration when Dick Cheney was vice president. His wife, Liz, was one of those crusaders against quote unquote liberal thought in uh, in academia and uh i can't remember whether it was the heritage foundation that she was part of uh but she led a crusade across this country getting what they deemed to be progressive thinking uh, uh, uh mm -hmm. academics removed from their institution so uh this goes back uh this goes back quite a while yeah, no, I, I, when you said uh, his wife, I think that's his daughter, Liz. No, his, his daughter is Lynn. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Well, e either way. Either way. It's either Lynn or Liz. <laughs> yeah. Lynn or Liz. Okay. One yeah. of the two. I, I recall that very, uh, very vividly. Uh, I know I had a situation at Temple University where uh, what I stood for and the speech that I was trying to, uh, to defend uh, was not acceptable. Lynn Cheney, as, you're right. It's Lynn yeah. Cheney. Mm -hmm. was it was not, his wife. Yeah, was not acceptable uh, uh, to the head of the department. And so I was fired. Uh, so this is not new. Uh, I'm saying to those who are now saying, well, uh, I'm a victim because it happened to me. Well, uh, why were you silent when it was happening to other people? It happened uh, to me too. Yeah, it happened to you too <laughs> at a historically black college to show you that it does not end at the color line. Right. <laughs> and black people have learned well from white people how to uh, silence freedom of speech. But uh, yeah, the, the American university has to be remade. Uh, it is a corrupt enterprise. It is a billionaire's playground. Uh, uh, Universities are more interested in gentrification and building up their endowments than they are with uh, educating students or discovering new truths. Uh, I think there was a recent uh, article uh, in one of the major newspapers, the New York Times, Washington Post, or somewhere, that said that uh, at Yale University, everybody is given an A. Uh, one, it's less work for the professors, they don't have to grade papers and so on. And uh, and everybody walks away happy. Uh, and so we find at universities this transactional relationship between professors and students. Students say, I'm going into debt to get a degree at a, at a university and you, the professor, works for me and you must Give me what I want because I am paying for an A or a high grade. I, I read someone somewhere where a professor said that, well, I gave a student an A and uh, they came to him, the student came to him and said, well, why didn't you give me 
credit for that uh, outside presentation I gave. He said, because we don't give A pluses. Well, you could have made an exception in my case. It's just that bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, Professor Gay, I think there's the other question uh, of, um, of her scholarship mm -hmm. and whether she plagiarized. Uh, and I think uh, the university has acknowledged or, or the committee that was looking into it acknowledged that in fact, plagiarism did occur, but let's keep it real. That's normal in the academy where careers and tenure are the most important thing. So a professor might write on a very obscure matter that is published in a relatively ex, uh, obscure journal, which claims to be peer review, and use that uh, obscure article, which may be plagiarized, uh, for tenure. And so uh, the question is, what is going on among elites? Let's be real. The president of Harvard is part of the elite class. Uh, Professor Gay, as was the case with the president of uh, the University of Pennsylvania, got caught up in elite conflict uh, having to do with the question of Israel and Zionism and whether or not uh, Jews are a protected group who stand above society and whose interests have to be defended even if in defending the rights of Jews and Zionists, you violate the right to freedom of speech of students and professors. That's what they got caught up in uh, and that's what brought them down. And by defending that, you also are defending genocide. Yes, oh, you no question. And you mentioned plagiarism. Well, Joe Biden as plagiarized, he became president. So, you know, that seems to be the order of the day. Yeah. Professor Dr. Anthony Montero, my brother, thank you so much for your time. I greatly, greatly appreciate you joining me today, uh, Anthony Montero. And thank you, and good luck with your podcast, Will. Hey, man, with, 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 with interviews with brothers like you, uh, this is nothing but success. <laughs> I, I got to thank uh, I got to thank you all so much for listening to the Con Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also, please follow and subscribe, leave a review, share the show, follow us on social media. You can find all the links below in the show description. Remember, folks, that this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Talk without analysis is just chatter. We don't chatter on Connecting the Dots. Peace. I'm out. Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.